Hey everyone, welcome to uh, Boys in the Hood, AP Chemistry Lesson. Um, today we're going to be talking about an important concept of chemistry that is essential to acing your chemistry exam, um, and this is kinetics. Kinetics is very important regarding reactions, so you have to know um, how molecules interact with each other and how one thing becomes another, and kinetics is essential to that, so let's begin. Chemical kinetics refers to the study of the rates of chemical reactions and the mechanisms by which they occur. The rate of a reaction is the change in concentration of a product or reactant over a unit of time. Similar to how velocity is a change in distance over time, reaction rate is the change in concentration over time. The entire theory of kinetics revolves around how particles of reactants interact to form products. We are also going to talk about reaction mechanisms, but that will be later in the lesson. Now let's talk about reaction rates. Consider the chemical equation reagent A decomposes into products B and C. Notice that the ratio of A to B to C is 1 to 1 to 1. Therefore, for every mole of A decomposed, one mole of B and one mole of C is formed. Logically, then the rate at which A is decreasing is the same as the rate that B and C are increasing. If there were two moles of B being formed for each mole of A decomposing, then the rate of formation of B would be twice the rate of the decomposition of A. Reaction rates are affected by a few key factors. First, there is concentration of reactants. Reaction rate is proportional to the concentration of a reagent or product. As you can see, rate and concentration of a substance are directly related. Second, there is the activation energy. Each reaction has to achieve a certain activation energy before it can proceed. Therefore, the more energy required, the slower the reaction will progress. Third is temperature. The higher the temperature, the faster the rate. Surface area of solids are also important to consider. All of these are illustrated through the Arrhenius equation. The rate constant K increases when activation energy decreases, and it increases when temperature increases. Notice that the exponent is negative. So the closer to zero it is, the greater the rate constant. To expand on this point, we can look at the following equation with the coefficients little a, b, c, and d. The rate is then given by the expression below. Let's discuss the rate constant k. K is an experimentally determined coefficient and is a proportionality constant in the relationship between rate and concentration. What is most important to remember about K is that it does not always have the same units. For different order reactions, K has a different unit. The overall order of a reaction is the sum of the exponents of the species that affect the rate of a reaction. These are the units for zero, first, and second order rate constants. Moving on to the rate laws. Rate laws are equations that relate concentration, time, the rate constant k, and the rate itself. There are two different rate laws. The differential rate law, which tells how the rate depends on the concentration, and the integrated rate law, which expresses how concentration depends on time. The differential rate law can be looked at with the following expression, where r is the rate, k is the rate constant for that particular equation, and x and y are the exponents of the rate determining species a and b. Big A and b are the instantaneous concentrations of these species. Given the rate and the concentrations, the rate constant can be arithmetically determined. Likewise, given the rate constant and the concentrations, the rate can be arithmetically determined. Concentrations and exponents of the expression can be determined experimentally. Yeah. The rate law can be determined experimentally if instantaneous rates and concentrations of a reaction are found and recorded. Consider the following table giving the concentrations of ammonium and nitrite and the rate of the reaction at three different points. This information can be used to find the exponents of each of the reactants and whether or not they are rate determining. Here you can see the actual solving for the exponents using experimental data. First, the ratio of the rates 
and the concentrations are set. For example, experiment 2 over experiment 1 is equal to the rate over rate and concentrations over concentrations. Notice that here, uh, the concentrations are plugged into the right side of the equation. Then, um, parts of the concentrations cancel, and you're left with this and the ratio of the rates. Then you have an equation, and you can just solve for the exponents. Here we didn't have to use log or natural log, but sometimes when this and this are not equal, then you'll have to do that. We did the same thing here. So after the exponents m and n are solved for, you have your final um, rate law, which would be rate is equal to k times NH4 plus to the first powder times NO2 minus to the first power. It is a second order rate law. The integrated rate law is a little bit more complicated. Instead of relating rate to concentration, the integrated rate law relates time to concentration. Now, there are three different integrated rate laws, one for each order. So we will focus on zero order first. The zero order reaction has the expression shown here. The concentration of A at time t equals the negative rate constant multiplied by the time t, plus the initial concentration of A. In a bit, we will look at this graphically and how it relates to the other orders. But before we do this, there is another important topic to cover, half-life. The half-life of a reaction can be easily derived from its rate law. For zero order, simply set the concentration of A at time t to half of the initial concentration of A, shown here. Then, by using some algebra, the following expression can be found. Half-life equals the initial concentration divided by 2 times the rate constant. This means that each successive half-life should take less time than the previous one. For first order reactions, the following expression is used. The natural log of the concentration of A at time t equals the negative rate constant times time t, plus the natural log of the initial concentration of A. As with zero-order reactions, first-order reactions have a half-life formula that can be easily derived, but is slightly different. By substituting in half the initial concentration of A for the concentration of A at time t, the following steps can be taken to arrive at a final expression for half-life. This is half-life equals 0 0.693 divided by the rate constant. This means that each half-life of first-order reactions takes the same amount of time. Now let's look at second order reactions. 1 divided by the concentration of A at time t equals the rate constant times time t, plus 1 divided by the initial concentration of A. As with each of the other orders, a new half-life equation can be found. Substituting in half the initial concentration of A for the concentration of A at time t, the following steps can be taken to arrive at the expression here. Half-life equals 1 divided by the rate constant multiplied by the initial concentration. This means that each successive half-life should be longer. Sometimes it is hard to measure the concentration of multiple rate-determining reactants at the same time experimentally. However, if the concentration of one reagent in a reaction is significantly smaller than the concentration of another, then it can be assumed that the concentration of the second reagent remains relatively unchanged while the first decreases. Then, only the concentration of the first reagent is measured. The concentration of the second can then be multiplied directly into the rate constant K to form a new constant, K prime. The second order reaction then becomes this first order reaction, called a pseudo first order reaction. Let's look at the graphs of each order reaction and how to apply them. Each order's graph is concentration over time and pertains to the integrated rate law in particular. The order of the reactions can be found using the graph experimentally given a set of values for time and concentration. Using the appropriate modification of concentration for each order, we look at the correlation of the graph. 
the graph that has the strongest correlation, or an absolute value of the correlation coefficient that is closest to 1, is the order of the reaction. The slope of each graph also represents the rate constant. For 0 and first order, the slope is the negative rate constant, and for second order, the slope is the positive rate constant. Reaction mechanisms are a tougher concept to grasp. Not all chemical reactions occur in one step, therefore we must look at the series of steps. Let's look at the following reactions. Each step of a mechanism is called an elementary reaction. Species that are in elementary reactions but are not in the final overall equation are called intermediates. Whenever dealing with mechanisms, the slowest step is always the rate determining step, meaning that the rate of that step determines the rate of the overall reaction. For elementary reactions, the differential rate law is very easy to determine. It is simply the rate constant k times each reagent raised to the power of its coefficient. The coefficient rule does not apply to overall reactions. When the slow step is an elementary reaction that contains an intermediate, you must put your rate law in terms that express the intermediate using non-intermediate species. If the second step here is the slow step, the rate law would be k times the concentration of c. However, c is an intermediate. To find concentration of C in terms of A and B, we use the first elementary reaction and its reverse reaction. The forward and backward reaction rates are equal naturally. However, they have different rate constants. We will call the rate constant of the backward reaction K negative 1. Then, setting the forward rate law equal to the reverse one, we solve for the concentration of C. Then, we plug it in to the overall rate law expression. The collision model is a model that attempts to explain how reactions occur. The basic premise is that molecules must collide in order to react. Similar to the kinetic molecular theory of gases, the collision model finds that an increase in temperature leads to an increase in the average velocity of particles, which leads to an increase in the frequency of collisions. However, not all collisions result in reactions, as determined experimentally. That's where activation energy comes in. In the 1880s, Savante Arrhenius postulates that a certain threshold is necessary for two particles who are colliding to overcome in order for them to form a product. The energy of this threshold is called the activation energy. That's the amount of energy that needs to be present in order for two reactants to form a product. However, even when a collision meets the activation energy, sometimes a reaction won't occur. That's because of orientation. In order for a reaction to progress, two molecules must be oriented correctly for them to form a new bond. So for a reaction to occur, first, the activation energy needs to be met, and second, the particles must be oriented correctly. Let's quickly go over how the Arrhenius equation can be used to determine activation energy. First, there is the graphical method. When values of K, the rate constant, and T, temperature in Kelvin, are known, they can be plotted against each other like so. A line of best fit that is drawn through them has the slope equivalent to negative activation energy over R, the gas constant. Make sure when you use R, you use the R that has the units joules per Kelvin times moles. The second method is the equation to the right. Plugging in the rate constants and temperatures from just two experiments the activation energy can be solved for. A potential energy diagram shows the change in energy as a reaction progresses. Here you can see the energy of the reactant on the left side, and here you can see the energy of the products on the right side. Here is the activated complex. This is the point in the reaction where there is maximum potential energy. There are multiple activated complexes on this diagram because in a reaction mechanism, there are multiple elementary reactions. Therefore, each elementary reaction will have its own activated complex. The activation energy is the amount of energy it takes to get the reactants to the activated complex, as shown here. The change in overall energy is shown here. For this reaction, um, this reaction is exothermic because the change in energy is negative. There is a drop in energy. If the change in energy were positive, then the reaction would be endothermic. Catalysts are substances whose presence can affect the rate of a reaction. There are three main things about catalysts to note. First, they increase the rate of a reaction without being consumed. Second, they don't appear in the overall equation for the reaction. And third, the way they speed up a reaction is through lowering activation energy, thereby creating a new mechanism path, and also 
by facilitating correct orientation, which is necessary for molecules to react. And that's it, y'all. I hope you all do really well on your kinetics test. And um, make sure you comment below what your favorite part of this video was, because I sure would like to know how much you love kinetics. Let me know. Thank you.